All right, okay. So today we're speaking about overtraining and overreaching. Really important topic because you get this wrong, and at best, your performance is going to stagnate. At worst, you're going to break down, get sick, and have to deal with those issues as well. So it's a really important topic for us to discuss. The very start of this topic, I'm going to kind of jump into the literature slightly and give you a good grounding and understanding of some terminology and categorize what overtraining is and into its subtypes. And then we're going to move away from that and speak a small bit about, you know, stress management and so forth. So to get started, just some terminology before we start. So first of all, homeostasis is the tendency to maintain a stable, relatively constant internal environment. So the whole objective with training is to induce some level of stress to disrupt homeostasis and drive an adaptation. But it's the level of stress that we actually um, place on athletes and ourselves that is very, very important, coupled, of course, with recovery times and nutrition and sleep and other factors like that as well. So I'm going to draw your attention to this paper from Nielsen et al. in 2013. And this was the prevention, diagnosis and treatment of overtraining syndrome. And essentially what the authors tried to do here was they tried to define what overtraining was and they tried to categorize it into a subtypes. So if we just have a look at this figure here, you can see on the top left-hand corner we have a process. And in this case, we have a training process. And if we keep moving to the right, we'll see that with the training process, we always have to induce some form of overload. So we can keep this really simple and we can think about like the fit principles of frequency, intensity, time, and type. Um, if, you have a, if you're thinking about strength training, it could either be accumulation or intensification, either you know, you're going heavier or you're going for more reps at the same weight, essentially. But there's always going to be some level of um, an intensification or intensified or an overload in your training as we move down along that, that arrow or that timeline. When we do that, we produce an outcome. So if we just see where we are here. We produce an outcome. And that outcome is going to, we're going to disrupt like physiological homeostasis um, when we actually, uh, when, when we induce that, that training overload. And that's going to create an acute fatigue. Now, within a space of days or weeks, um, especially if we get the fit principles or the intensi intens intensity of the training right, that's going to give us what we call functional OR functional overload and functional overload means that we just have a temporary performance decrement like you can think of a training camp and then once we recover we come above our baseline and we give ourselves a new adaptation for which to build the next block of training and again now if as we move along down down along the timeline if the training is too heavy or too hard with inadequate recovery times and so forth and it goes on too long, then we start non-functionally overreaching. And the biggest thing we see, right, from a performance standpoint with non-functional overreaching is that we get a stagnation in, in our performance. And then if that continues on for longer, even, you know, for a longer period of time again, we go into, we start flirting with what we call OTS, which is overtraining syndrome. And this could go on over a matter of months, and this is where we do, from a performance standpoint, start to see um, a decrease in performance and even an element of illness and sickness in our training as well. So where we want to try to get to is functional overload in that short term, um, in, that, in that those short term outcomes of functional overload. Now, it's really important that I just make one little um, observation that the word syndrome is used in overtraining. And it's, it's called a syndrome because it's a syndrome in every aspect of the word syndrome. And syndrome means it's multifactorial. So there's not just one factor that's going to result in overtraining. There's going to be multiple factors in that. And we're going to cover them as we move down along in the presentation. So I just want to talk about um, supercompensation. And some people might be aware of this or some people won't. Okay? But essentially what supercompensation is, if you see here, we have this horizontal line and we have work. So you give someone some form of stress for whatever system it is. So remember like we're stressing whatever whatever system of the body that we're looking at. Um, and then we get like some training fatigue, 
we get a drop off below baseline. Okay, so we start overreaching slightly. Then we'll see that we get an element of recovery, we get an adaptation that's above the initial level. And that's really, really important. Okay, so it can be described as an overload of stimulus to disrupt homeostasis, induce fatigue, and cause an adaptation. And I've underlined the word fatigue because fatigue is really, really important here because we have to get the amount of fatigue right that we induce on the athlete. So if we have a look at adaptation theory, okay, um, in simple terms, we might see something like this. Now, if we look at the, the straight black line, okay, that's where the training is adequate. So much similar to what we just looked at the previous slide, we have this <clears throat> biological state before the stimulus, okay? We induce a level of fatigue, so we create an overload. There is an element of overreaching, we recover from that, we go above the baseline, and we get ready to build the next platform. So it's just like building platforms. It's like literally climbing the stairs, that we keep building and building and building on top of previous sessions. So there we're starting to build um, an element of um, fitness and an element of capacity with whatever system that we're trying to, we're trying to build. So we give a stimulus, and we give the correct amount, and you wait long enough before you give the stimulus again. Now, if we have a look at the broken line at the bottom, you can see that that's where we're training too hard. So we can see that we push them too hard, we can create too much fatigue, okay? That fatigue drops us further below baseline, it takes us longer to recover, and we're, getting, uh, we're not getting a rise above baseline for us to build the next block of training again. And this is a really important um, concept of adaptation theory that we need to try to understand. So it's the intensity of training and the new stimulus must be correct. So I just popped this little slide in here and it just exists to illustrate that overtraining and undertraining are highly interrelated, that you know they, are, they coexist, okay? So we can see here with the blue line, that you can see a normal progressive overload you might use. And you can see that we are just inducing the right level of um, right stimulus, we're recovering to the right level, and we're starting to build those stairs that I essentially spoke about a while ago. And what we're doing is we're avoiding that non-functional, okay? So we don't have that drop off in performance, okay? So we can see that we have performance here on, on that y-axis anyway, okay? So or not, we don't have that drop off in performance. Whereas if you look at the, the red line, you can see that we have too many high intensity bouts around each other, and therefore we don't have enough to, time to adapt from it, and we get this non-functional overload and this underperformance, and you can see that we're starting to drop below that performance line. Now what is interesting is if you have a look at the green line, okay, that dotted line, that if we stop that at any point and we have some level of active, active recovery and rest, then we can bring us back up to that horizontal line again, that baseline, and that we can start to see an increase in performance again. <clears throat> so then just through this slide in here, because I think there is a very important concept that we should try to understand, and that's maximum recoverable volume, okay? And this, again, is the most training that you can do and recover from. So there is times that you want to, you might want to do a significant amount of training within a short period of time, but you must realize that once you hit that maximum recoverable volume, then that that's your limit before you're going to start to see those negative adaptations. You want to read a little bit more of this. Um, Chaz Wesley, Wesley Smith has some really good talks about this. Like we took a uh, picture here on the right is a group that we took to Mike's gym, and we essentially go really hard for a short space of time. Um, but the real goal here is that we don't overtrain the same systems. So, you know, if you run six times a day, then you're absolutely crushing the same system. Whereas if you're doing skill work, if you're doing um, kind of high metabolic work, if you're doing um, strength work, yeah, you're definitely taxing the general system. Um, 
However, you can space that out quite intelligently so that you can at least prolong the amount of training that you're going to do over a time. But it's very, very individual because, again, we're all individual snowflakes and everyone has different physiology and adaptation processes and nutrition and sleep and so forth. But number one, having an idea of what your maximum recoverable, recoverable volume is, is really important. And then trying to shift that so that you can get more, 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 more work done um, is important to that as well. So we have to consider other stresses in this as well, okay? So, you know, the stress as coaches that we place on athletes could possibly be the, not the hardest stress that they're going to get within life itself, okay? So we're going to see things like, you know, financial stress, exam stress, relationships, mental health, um, you know, work, you know, like life, health in itself, health of family members, um, all these things will, you know, they will elicit a level of stress on the athlete. And the thing about it is, you know, it doesn't always have to come from those physical stresses, right? And if you have someone who's, you know, dealing with a boss at work who's, or dealing with a home situation that isn't conducive to um, allowing them to return to homeostasis, essentially, okay, we end up with, this chronic level of stress that we're pushing all the time. And that's something that we need to be aware of as coaches because we could get 25 or 30 athletes and we could have essentially our session laid out for those athletes, but they might be coming in with 25 or 30 um, different levels of stress coming from these sources. So this is where the softer skills of actually coach or talking to athletes, having 30 seconds to actually ask them, you know, how they are, how their day is going. Without interfering, it's important that we, you know what I mean, we don't pry, but it's about building relationships and it's about building the confidence in the athlete to be able to communicate these things with you. And it mightn't just be you, it could be some member of the coach and staff. And um, physios are actually a good one for this because that time that players spend on the physio table um, is a window of opportunity for them to open up about different issues. Um, and I think that this is something that we overlook but it's certainly something that we need to be aware of because from a physiological standpoint, it has a massive impact. So the key point from that is that these different stressors, you know, they all cause the same physiological immune or um, psychological response. So here we have these implications of this stress, okay? So this is a stress response curve. So we can see again that we have arousal stress on the x-axis and we have performance on the y-axis. So we have this curve, all right? Now it's very important that we realize that athletes don't want to avoid all stresses. We need to be, for athletes to be resilient. Like that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to induce a level of stress on them. But the thing about it is, if they have lots of stress coming from those external sources, then we're going to be limited with the amount of stress that we can impose on them because we have this tipping point. So we can see here that we have good stress and de-stress and right up at the top of the brow of that hill, we have fatigue. Um, just below it, we have our comfort zone. The further the closest we get to, to that tipping point of the brow of the hill, then we're gonna start to flirt with um, stagnation for, in performance, exhaustion, ill health and breakdown. So we want athletes to be able to manage stress so that they can keep as much in their locker for training stress as possible. And that should make some kind of like intuitive sense. So we need to take a holistic um, approach to this. It's not just about crushing them with our training sessions. And this is why I feel that, you know, it's people before cones. And if you can have that time to talk to people and just ask them how their home life is going, then, you know, you can adapt your session on the go. And I all like that that's something that I would always do in my own practice. I would have an idea of what I want to do for a session, but I would always have an element of flexibility within the session. And then I'll see how the athlete presents to me on a given night. And from there, I'm going to make my call from that. And some people might argue that that's not highly scientific, but I would argue that this is the art of coaching. The art of coaching is responding to what you see. Um, otherwise, if we try to you know, beat a square peg to a round hole, 
then what we're going to end up is we're going to end up damaging an athlete. We're going to end up with a stagnation in performance at best, as I've said already, and at worst, we could end up with um, exhaustion, ill health, and breakdowns. And those breakdowns can happen physically or mentally. So, um, you know, this little table is here just to give us some examples of what you can actually see. All right. Now, I'm not going to spend too long on this, but what I've done with this is I have broken this into, um, you know, both uh, psychological and um, uh, physical, okay? Uh, physiological, sorry, and psychological. Now, the one thing I will say this is that the only constant or consistent thing to overtraining that we're going to see is overperformance. Everything else, and you can see why we call this a syndrome, because you can see just how diverse this is. It's massively diverse, okay? Um, the only thing that if you can consistently put back to, okay, we could be overtraining is a stagnation of performance, all right? So if we look at the um, physiological ones, we can, you know, an awful lot of players can't, or an awful lot of coaches can't measure these because they might have access to, you know, testing blood pressure or, you know, um, testing VO2 max or blood lactates. But very simple one is just decreased energy levels. If you're on the field and if you see someone and they just look tired, then maybe um, it's time just to have a simple intervention there and just have a chat in, in his or her ear. Um, and of course, kind of hand in hand to that is like increased fatigue, lower tolerance to workloads. The other thing is, of course, is susceptibility to illness. If you find that an athlete is starting to pick up like um, just head colds or whatever kind of you know viral infections and you know, he's fighting these things off, then he's immune compromised. And that is a um, big, big indication of overtraining. Um, uh, yeah, okay, and then when we, we look at the psychological ones, you know, there's a list of them again here from, you know, disturbed sleep, irritability, depression, increased anxiety. You can have a read of this yourself. We try to put this together with, with measuring RPEs and wellness measures and, you know, and I think that wellness measures are actually quite sensitive to this. If you get players um, energy, sleep, mood, and soreness on a daily basis, and if players are logging that, then it will give us a good indication objectively of, you know, um, how we can monitor overtraining. Okay, so again, back to that Mucin et al. paper that I opened up with. Um, I'm not going to spend too long on this, but they have this diagnostic tool. And what's happened is... Um, you know, coaches, athletes, um, researchers, we've all looked for more of an objective measure to actually make a diagnosis of overtraining syndrome. And what they came up with here is, they came up with this um, questionnaire and it works like an algorithm, okay? So we start at the top left and you have unexplainable uh, performance drop. If there's um, like no, you know, um, unexplainable performance drop, you move to the right and then overtraining syndrome is not likely. If there is, you move down. And you can see how it works like an algorithm. So persistent fatigue, exhaustion, lasting more than four weeks. No, then it's not overtraining syndrome. It's not likely to be overtraining syndrome. Yes, we move down again and we start digging a bit deeper. Disease is associated with performance drop. And this is where we look at like viral infections, bacterial infections, inflammatory diseases, metabolic infections, you know, or sorry, metabolic diseases. Like even think about the likes of diabetes and so forth like this. This is where um, we start to dig a little bit deeper. If, if your answer is no, okay, you move down. If your answer is yes, then you move across. And it's 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 very simple little tool that you can use and you'll find it on that paper if you want to want to research it and dig it out. Um, and again, what it's just going to do is it's going to give coaches and athletes a little bit of um a little bit of an objective diagnostic marker. All right. So if we have a look at like overreaching studies all right now as you can imagine like overreaching studies are quite hard to implement because for unethical grounds um so a lot of the studies are observational in nature where they will just you know um follow a, a cohort of athletes for a certain um you know period of time and you'll get observational um studies from that <clears throat> however this paper was actually really, really interesting, right? So um, it was monitoring overreaching in rugby league players, okay? And like the aim of this study essentially was to identify the markers of non-functional overreaching um, in team sports athletes undertaking intensive training loads. 
So what they done was they took, um, I think it was 18 professional rugby league players, and they were randomly assigned into two matched groups. One group and completed six weeks of normal training, and they were the NT group, while the other group was deliberately overreaching, okay, through intensified training, all right? So if we have a look here, um, we can see that the IT group is the intensified training, and the NT group are um, the non-intensified group, okay? If we just have a look at the combined amount of training, and we can see that throughout the six weeks, it increased quite significantly with the intensified training. So this is in minutes. So there was 341 minutes in week one, 399 in week two, 529 in week three. And you can see that by the time they got up to week four, they had built up to 746 combined minutes of field and resistance training. Whereas the non-intensified training group um, it wasn't as severe. Even though there was an overload, they didn't have the severity. Okay. So the results of this were really, really interesting. Okay. So one of the things they done was they had the MSFT, which is the multi-stage fitness test. And what they done was they recorded every Thursday of each training week. So we can see here that um, if we have a look at this graph to the left, this is the multi-stage fitness test performance change. Okay. So we can see week one, week two, week three, week four, week five, and week six. We can see that this dark group, this dotted um, dark dot, are the intensified training group. And we can see that they had a slight increase on week one. Then from week two, three, four, and five, they had a massive fall off on their scores. So that should really give us um, a strong indication, okay, that that was non-functional training and there was a massive performance fall off. So they had a huge performance deficit, okay? Whereas if you look at the other training group, the intensified training group, you can see that they week on week progressively got that little bit better at the test. So their performance was increasing as the weeks went on. So that they were essentially not falling into this performance deficit. Now, what's interesting here is at week six, they had a taper week, okay? And once they had their taper week, when they retested, okay, the intensified training group actually ended up at the same point as the non-intensified training group. So you can see that the end state was the same, but how they got there was very, very, very different, okay? So that non-intensified training group, you know, they achieved that through functional overreaching. So they had an increase in performance week on week. And then the other, then the, the intensified training group, they reached it, but they were overreaching non-functionally and they had a massive performance deficit. And I think that this was a really, really good paper because the other thing that I actually took from this, okay, that is that the data would actually suggest that the multi-stage fitness test may be a very useful tool for monitoring tolerance to training in team sport athletes. So, you know, I have done that in the past myself, like in the middle of a league, um, I will throw out um, some form of, I, I haven't done it with the multi-stage fitness test because um, I mightn't want the same level of turning and I might want to induce the same level of eccentric loading, but I have like popped in a 1K just to see where fellas are with that. And to me, if they have dropped off quite a bit mid-league, just gives me an indication that maybe I need to pull back a small bit. Contrary to what a lot of people might think, a lot of people might think that they're actually detraining through the league, but this is um, a nice little bit of evidence to support what, what, what I said. Okay, so here we have this, this J-shaped model to exercise volume and susceptibility to um, infection. And this came from, from Neiman in 1994. And essentially what we can take out of this is the amount of exercise we do is either going to make us more or less susceptible to infections. So if we have a look up here on the left, um, URTI is upper respiratory tract infection, by the way. So we have risk of URTI on the y-axis and we have exercise training volume on the x-axis. So we can see that your average, um, your average Joe who doesn't train a whole, a whole lot will say, no, he has, you know, just about an average chance of uh, URTI infections, okay? However, if you take on a moderate amount of training, okay, 
Um, then what happens is you develop this below average chance of URTIs. Then if we start shifting over here to the right, if we start you know, pushing our training volume higher and higher and higher, what we're starting to do here is we're starting to go and push higher up along the y-axis until we have an above average, above average chance or risk of URTI infections. So again, back to what I said, we really need to manage that training load over time because if we don't manage that training overload over time, this J-shaped model um, would really give us an indication that we will become more susceptible to these infections. Um, just and look just due to physiological um, reasons why we might just suppress our immune systems. Okay, and then to the right, this is actually a really, really uh, interesting study as well. Okay, and this came from Pe uh, Peters and Bateman in 1983. And this was the percentage of runners reporting UTI symptoms seven days following a 56 um, kilometer marathon. So, as you can imagine, like uh, an ultra marathon. Um, territory is is very 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 um, taxing on the system okay so we can see the time to complete the, ra the race on this x-axis of less than four hours those athletes had a higher percentage of uh, chance of reporting urtis now the other side of this we must note that this is uh, just self-reporting so you know what i mean we have to take that for what it is in terms of the research as well but that being said again it gives us a nice little um a nice little understanding of okay these athletes who were running the fastest times obviously would have had a more intense training schedule leading up to it um, and therefore these are the athletes who are pushing further on this curve here to the left i.e this higher training volume and higher training intensities and therefore they have the higher chances of um, picking up urtis and urtis are one of the most commonly um, one of the most commonly um, reported um, and diagnosed infections in athletes and you know when we think of the you know the, the issue we're in in the current climate climate with with um, coronavirus and you know upper respiratory tract infections and suppressing our immune system then we should be quite mindful of this research and of what we're doing okay so like you know very simply on this this is just a really simple slide to make a really simple point okay so we have this open window theory okay so it's a simplistic view of how we might look at immunity to training okay so essentially like moderate exercise is good and it decreases our infection or in our risk of infection however intense intense exercise might benefit us at the start but you know chronically over time it's going to open a window for infection and it's really really important that we understand that and we need to think of immunity much like we did back at our previous slides with that adaptation theory and super adaptation super compensation theories as well okay and again if we have a look at this this is the open window theory and super compensation and it's just that stairs we spoke about from you know building whatever system um, through supercompensation and adaptation um, from a positive standpoint, from a functional standpoint. And here we can see how we can suppress our immune system using the very, very same theory where we have a you know, normal immune function, we give a bout of exercise, we suppress it slightly. And not a bout of intense exercise, suppress it again. Not a bout of intense exercise, we suppress it again until we end up with this chronically suppressed um, immune function. <clears throat> and it's important that we really, really understand this, okay? Because over a long period of time, this would have an accumulative effect at suppressing our immune systems, and therefore, you know, we open up that window for, for, um, for sickness. All right, now, you know, this is where, you know, we're down to our last two slides on this, and this is where I'm just going to talk about stress management. Now, I'm going to do separate videos um, on, you know, sleep and, and nutrition and so forth. But I think stress management is, is quite important, especially at this time, again, um, noting that this webinar has been shot um, during this coronavirus crisis, you know, um, and, you know, a lot of, an awful lot of people have a lot of time in their hands. 
they might want to train very, very hard because they want to use up their time. And I appreciate that for a lot of athletes. It might seem on the outset like the perfect window for training. But I'd like to think that on the previous slides, I have highlighted that overreaching isn't exactly the best thing to be doing at this time. And managing stress, because we know that, you know, it's a syndrome in terms of overtraining and overreaching. Um, and we want to realize that we need to take a holistic approach and we need to leave enough in the cup for training stress. And if we can manage these other external stresses, then at least we're doing our part to allow us to train that little bit further as well. Okay. So the first thing with stress management is just to simplify, you know, simplify our life. Um, the less things we have to worry about, then the more space we have left in our life for, you know, just simple everyday life. If we're constantly being bombarded in this information age with, with you know, news and readings and um, things to do, then it just adds to the stress of our everyday lives. Okay. So in terms of our actions, I'd always encourage people to do an audit of, you know, what's helping or what's hindering your life in terms of where you know where you want to go in life all right so like think about television does it really contribute positively to um how you see the world at the moment yourself you know does it influence how you see your world and therefore does it influence the actions you know i always tell this story about watching the champions league final um a couple of years ago um with shane my my, my middle son and ads came on and there was five ads that came on during the Champions League final. The first ad was for Betfair 365, the second ad was for Carlsberg, the third ad was for McDonald's, the fourth ad was for Problem and TSB, and the fifth ad was for Paddy Power. And I turned around to him and I said, you know, do you notice anything about the ads? And he didn't. And, you know, in two and a half minutes, he had been told to drink alcohol, to gamble, to eat shit food, and when his money ran out, to borrow more money and to gamble again. And essentially, you know, subconsciously, people don't see that. But, if, you know, if we can consciously create awareness around these things, because those ads were specifically put in there at that time to drive actions of literally thousands of young males between the age of possibly, I don't know, 16 to, you know, 40. I don't know. But the point is that an awful lot of the time that we need to do an audit on what we watch and what we allow to let into our lives um, because they drive our actions. Okay, so information bans and rules, you know, this constant stream of news, this constant stream of social media. In my opinion, news, um, I'm not saying it's not relevant. I just feel it's not that useful in my life. Um, I think it, it drives fear, it drives bigotry, it drives hatred, it drives negativity, and I try to insulate myself from that. And again, I'm not saying that it's not relevant. Of course, it's relevant. Um, it's just not useful to me and to, to how I want to live my life. And so, um, social media, again, look, um, limit, limit, limited to windows if possible. Um, hypocritical for me to say that because I end up invariably due to the nature of my work. I'm on it quite a bit and it's definitely in terms of stress management, the one thing that I need to pull down, but at least limit what's on it, limit your circle of friends, what they're putting on. It can be a very powerful thing. It can be a positive thing. But if you're listening to Nora up the road giving out about, you know what I mean, Johnny up the road, then it's not particularly useful. However, there is a lot of people doing a lot of good things on it. And if you allow their information um, into, your, into your social media feeds, then it can be a positive thing. Um, emails as well. You know, an awful lot of us have taken work home now. So just have windows from when we work emails, when we read them and we don't read them. Um, a good book on this is The Power of Less. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about it, but um, it's definitely a good reference and something to be looking at. Um, the other thing is, you know, stress reduction, spending time in nature, going for walks, perfect time to do that. Um, earthing, you know, water and fire. I'm always amazed by water and fire. It's obviously, you know, fire, there's something very primitive about fire. Fire was a big part of our evolution. You know, if it not for fire, we wouldn't have had the ability to cook different foods, our brains wouldn't have grown and adapted and we wouldn't be what we are now. Um, I always tell the story of, you know, we speak about meditations now, but I remember calling to my grandfather and, you know, we just sit around the fire 
there'd be no conversation, there'd be no talking, but everything revolved around the fire. And it was something very therapeutic. There was something very soothing and there was something very mindful about just looking into a fire. And I still find that now. Um, water is also, you know, it's also a life force. Um, big part of our evolution, big part of our culture, big part of history. You know, we wouldn't survive without water through, you know, transport links and so forth, um, food links. So there's something very therapeutic about, you know, sitting at a beach, listening to water, listening to water flow. Um, earthing is another, another useful tool. Um, so earthing essentially is just grounding yourself um, to the earth, to grass, barefoot, um, just, just feeding off the energy from that. Um, you know, th these, things, these things are very real. They mightn't be as scientifically based and reviewed as what I've spoke about before this. But I certainly think that there's just quite a bit of merit to all these things. Um, nothing time. So call it a reset. We recently done this with a, with, 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 with a crew. Um, red light day. Find a secret spot somewhere where you just um, can totally zone out. And that's your place. And that's, you know what I mean? Completely, I suppose, individual and confined to just you. And have that spot. And, you know what I mean? Visit that throughout the day. Um, because I think that you know having time to do nothing is time well spent heart math institute so you know the heart math institute is where it's based around breathing and heart rate variability essentially where you have a pacer on the app that you download and you have a little a little earpiece that you flick on and it takes your heart it takes your pulse and you match your breathing to your pulse and the the pacer on your app just essentially links in and syncs with your heart rate and that pacer is moving at the same rate that your heart is beating and you just try to sync your breathing to that so it's a proven way to you know what i mean shift shift hormones decrease um cortisol increase dhea um which are all all obviously been a, a highly beneficial things to do okay and um, family connections social connections really really important as well um, the foundation of happiness is in our families and it's really important that we find these things too and we find time with them. Now, the other side of that is these can be stressful for many people as well. Um, but again, you know, we're not going to talk, you know, individually on different things like that. But in the main, there is people in your family that we have really tight connections with and, you know, spending time with those people is really, really important. Um, and then breath work, you know, Wim Hof work. Um, I, I, I try to, especially at these times, get two five minute blocks of Wim Hof uh, breathing every day and um, consciously breathing. I went for a run yesterday, just 7K where I just nose breathed. So it was just all nose breaths um, just brought everything back to my breathing. No headphones, no nothing, just connected to my breath. And I think that there's loads of apps to like check out the Oxygen Advantage, um, check out Wim Hof, check out box breathing. There's loads and loads and loads of this to the point where I could do a full 20 minute um, webinar on these. But again, um, breath work is, is, is highly therapeutic, highly valuable, and a big part of managing stress as well. Okay, so there we have an overreaching, overtraining, stress management. I hope that there was something in that that um, you found useful, that you'll definitely use in your practice, you'll definitely use in your own training or with your 